Hello everyone, welcome here in Bogota and thank you for coming. I'm Attila and I'm from the Swarm Foundation and today I'm going to talk about the Swarm, the, where the project is at the moment, how you can run a light node, how you can run a full node and talk a bit about future plans as well. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with Swarm, but basically Swarm is decentralized data storage and distribution technology. So also, I'm not sure how much of you are familiar with this original idea of uh, Ethereum being the word CPU, but at that uh, the Swarm origin is coming from the same time. And then at that time, there was this idea of this holy trinity where Ethereum is the word CPU, Swarm would be the, the word hard drive, and then Whisper would have been the uh, messaging system. And like things turned out to be differently, but still the, the idea and the roots of Swarm is coming from that. So you can think of Swarm as being the, a, a huge hard drive based on peer-to-peer -peer technology. And then when I'm talking about Swarm, people usually ask me, okay, so how is it different from IPFS? Like this is the question that everyone is interested in. And then um, it's quite different, but as since the, the goals of the projects are similar, then I think it's worth mentioning like what are the, the some kind of core ideas that are built into Swarm and maybe differentiating with different uh, or alternative decentralized storage systems. So one thing is that uh, Swarm has a very strong focus on privacy pre preserving and, uh, and being permissionless. So it means that you, in order to upload to the to Swarm to the, this world hard disk, you don't have to have a node. So that's a different. From IPFS, you have to have your node. And I will talk about later, like a bit more the, the, the differences in like how the data is handled. But then again, going forward on this list, like uh, Swarm being Ethereum native, which means that uh, it uses a lot of primitives, like crypto primitives that are used in Ethereum. And also the smart contracts it uses are running on uh, EVM, so it doesn't invent its own blockchain and it does not try to create that problem because that is solved by others and it's uh, not the area of focus. Um, it has robust defenses against blocking or changing access, so that um, this is kind of the thing that we call censorship resistance. So once data is uploaded to the network, as long as there is someone who wants to keep it on the network, then nobody else can take it down from the network. Or that's the idea, and then I will talk about later where we are with that. Uh, there is also a feature which is like auto-scaling, so the, the, because this is, a this is a distribution network as well, uh, the data is, uh, uh, um, you know, when, when the data is downloaded, then the copies are stored on nodes, and therefore, uh, it's it's available on more nodes, so that it has this uh, this uh, property that like more people you sharing the same kind of data sets, the more copies there are on the network, and that can help with like a CDN type of functionalities. There is integrity protection with content addressing, but also there is mutable updates with signed chunks, so you can have both of these things together, and with that you can think of also like as a, not only just storing like static data sets, but like have data structures that can be updated and can be used for application layers. Uh, and eventually it forgets data or content that is no longer relevant to preserve. So as I will explain, like you have to pay in order to get the data on the network. And if nobody is paying for the data, then it means that it's no longer relevant, so it will be deleted. So these are like, from this you may get an initial impression. And I will go to some details, but not in a very deep level, because that's not the focus of this uh, workshop. It's more, it's going to be hands-on, so don't worry, just, I just give a small introduction so that everyone is on the same page. Um, so basically, when you upload data to the Swarm, what happens is that Swarm takes the data, splits it into 4K chunks, 
and then assigns the the uh, yeah and then optionally currently it's optional en encrypt the chunks and then based on the chunks content address finds the nodes that should be storing it on the network and that means that the data is spread on the network so then you want to upload a, a, a data so any data onto the network then when you have a node then it will find the nearest nodes that matches the content address of the of the data of the data chunk and send it there and then when you try to download the data the same logic happens so then basically you access any nodes and then it will find the route on the network and then get back the chunks uh, from the the nodes that has the address closest to the chunks address and so uh, that's the basics of like the storing data on swarm and uh, the main concept and uh, also there are different kind of nodes so as as swarm evolved we realized that one size does not fit all uh, and then at the beginning we only had this full node functionality where like the nodes were storing data it was also used for uh, accessing the network and uh, like basically all the functionality were in the full nodes but eventually we realized that most people won't necessarily need uh, full node functionality so we separated like into different ways how you can access the the data on the swarm network there is a gateway that we provide uh, as a as a free trial version so to speak there is an ultralight node which you can install on your laptop and then it doesn't use too much resources but then with that you cannot uh, upload to the network because in order to upload to the network you will have to pay for the data for the, someone to store it for you and that's something that you can do with a light node and i will um, i will install this on my computer like we will see like how the internet works so far it was not always great but let's uh, i hope someone like sacrificed some goats to the demo gods today so that we can <laughs> have some luck with that um and yeah so we we basically realized that uh, if you want to see like a web 2 kind of view of like this uh different product packaging then then i can show you this that basically um there is a free trial on the gateway that you can access from the browser you don't need to install anything you can just go to this, this website you can upload data download data but it's limited to certain size and then also that as the nature of the gateways is that the gateway operators must uh, uh, you know comply with the law and then remove some data and then at that point like censorship resistant cannot be maintained or guaranteed if you want to access directly the network then the the recommended way to do that is by using either the swarm desktop app which is like easy to install and uh, you can install it on your laptop or desktop computers and then most we, we recommend this to most people that want to create data and store network or just want to simply access the data on the network and it it comes into varieties like this ultralight node which does not uh, require you to do any kind of transactions on the blockchain but that's limited so then you can only access data but not upload if you want to upload you will have to buy the the swarm native token which is called bzz and then with that you can buy uh, capacity on the network so that you can store your data and with the full node you can it has the full functionality but it also means that you need to run this uh, on a more li most likely on a separate uh, server because like if you run the full node on your laptop machine for example it uses it, it may use your network connection in times that you don't want to it has to be run 24 7 because then that provides the availability for the data for others on the network so if you close your laptop then uh, i will talk about later like you wouldn't be able to participate in the in the earning part of the of this thing so like how how you can earn money by uh, by storing data for other people and um, so yeah like we realized that the the full node is not 
a very good choice for most people having running it on their laptops and stuff. So for that, we recommend uh, the desktop app and the full node. We recommend people who are more seriously want to um, store data for other people. And then, so maybe to recap like this, like the light node considerations is lightweight, use only resources if you request them, on demand, so it doesn't have to be running 24 seven, and you can start without a penny. So that means that you don't need to make any transactions to start using it, but um, later you can uh, unlock it with more functionality. And uh, the full node has different hardware requirements. So like currently we recommend that you can start running it on Raspberry Pi with like four G RAM, 70 gigs of disk space. It has to be an SSD. So most likely if you want to use a Raspberry Pi, you have to connect your external SSD to that because it's quite demanding on the disk as a storage system should be. It's always on, so it's supposed to be run 24 seven. And you have to do one transaction in order to participate in the, uh, in uh, being a full node. Basically, you have to deploy a checkbook contract so that you uh, can uh, participate in something that we call the bandwidth incentives. So let me just talk a bit about that. So basically, there are two kinds of incentives. There is bandwidth incentives that is like incentives, like money that you can earn for sharing data on the network. And then there's storage incentives that is like how you can earn by storing uh, data for other people. And uh, so like everyone, maybe I don't have to explain here the importance of incenti incentives here, but like maybe what's relevant here is that like these two things are separate and currently um, only the the bandwidth incentives are uh, running on the on the mainnet. So currently, you cannot really earn um, money by storing data for other people. This is something that we are working on currently, and this is on testnet. So we are planning to rolling it out like soon once the testing is done. Uh, and yeah, so maybe just to show you like the, the, the data economy in the network is that what we see is that it, um, what is interesting in Swarm is that consumers who are downloading data from the network are actually paying for uh, downloading data. Uh, so um, there is a, a way to, to use it without paying, but that means that your, uh, sp your speed is limited so that you don't Basically, the, the nodes are prioritizing paying nodes who are paying for downloading content. Uh, and so the, the interesting th thing here is that uh, this uh, enables a new kind of economy. So um, like the, currently, the internet has this problem that by storing data can be quite cheap. But the problem is that if you try to store a large amount of data and it gets your project gets successful and people start downloading data from you, then suddenly your costs are not on the storage side, but actually on the bandwidth side. So if you're using Amazon or something like that, then you will have to pay a lot for the, the bandwidth. And that can be for small project that can be like prohibitively expensive. So. Um, like storing like I know I had this example that storing like 40 gigabytes for a year is like a few dollars maximum. But like if there are like 10,000 people downloading that from you, you can start paying like money in the $10,000 range and then small projects may not be able to afford that. And by changing this uh, kind of dynamics and making the downloaders pay can enable new kind of applications where even like small projects can afford to to host big data sets and also this enables hosting public data sets or common good data sets that we consider like for example wikipedia data or or open street maps data or like it would be good to see like blockchain data it doesn't really make sense to blockchain data be stored on all the the nodes it's, it would make sense to have like one common good space where everyone could uh, finance and and maintain as a common good and there are many other use cases that this can enable and what i see here is that this can create this kind of new 
kind of applications where business uh, opportunities can rise, when data creators can create, they create something that is stored on Swarm and then that can be shared with consumers and then here you can figure out like you upload data, you get back the reference and then by like, giving access to that data can be turned into uh, business opportunities. So that is also something that we, we considered solved problem. And now I, I'm going to the, the more hands-on part of the, the workshop. So I will go to the terminal and do some stuff that people does usually in the terminal. And so the first thing I would like to talk about is that, uh, so the, the Swarm uh, currently has a, an implementation called B and uh, you can download B from the website and you can install it on your computer and then you can uh, configure it and start uh, interacting with that. And uh, so there is a dev mode for this, like I wanted to show this to you because that's quite easy to use and it's quite uh, handy when you, when you are not sure if you want to be invested in this and you don't want to spend too much time on that. So basically, once you have the B binary installed on your machine, which is called B, then this dev mode can be just invoked with this B dev. It starts up and then it's ready to serve requests. So you can access the, the B API on the port 1633. And it also has some other functionality in ports 1635. Like it's mm, currently that like data related functionality can be accessed on the 33 port and then administrative functions can be accessed on the 35. And uh, maybe I can show you like the, uh, the documentation for this. So like we have uh, quite complete documentation so how the API works and then like, I, maybe I will do this at the end, like uh, once I went through all the things. So I just wanted to show you that basically like trying it in dev mode can be quite easy and it does not take you a lot of time if you just want to try to um, upload data, download data, check out, fill the API, then, then I, this is the recommended way to do. And then, uh, there is a, a, a desktop app, so for that I will need to, I forgot to do this, but I will do some quick uh, uh, housekeeping, so application support. So I already have it installed on my machine, so I need to basically, um, uh, sorry about this. So. I just moved the folder so it forgets everything. So you have you can go to the website and then on the website you can yeah it's later this is going to be handy. So on the website you can download it and I already downloaded it so that it's on my machine and I don't have to rely on the network. However, like installing this like this is a completely networked software so uh, in order to demonstrate this, I, I will need also network connection to be working. But the point is that, uh, so there's a desktop app, it's an Electron app, so it's available on all major platforms, Mac, Linux, Windows, and uh, it has uh, different versions that you can download. Um, so if you, this is the, the GitHub page, but you can also download it from the website. And once you have this file uh, on your machine, okay, wait, let me just find this. Like here, download Swarm Desktop. Uh -huh. Let me, sorry about this. Um, yeah, zero. Oh, I don't have it. Okay, so then let's do, like, how would you do it? So I download the X64 DMG version because I have the, uh, okay, maybe I don't do that. Okay, sorry. Uh, I will just open the, the downloaded version. Uh, yeah, I guess this is going to work. 
So you, yeah, okay, I already installed it. So I just need to start it. Like you install it as a Mac app, you put this in the application folder, and then you start it. And then, uh, yeah, it starts with uh, downloading B. So currently it's, uh, it just, uh, yeah, it's again, I didn't think of this because on a normal network, this doesn't take too long. And this is only needed because we support M1 Max, so it has a different version and it has a different B version, so it downloads the M1 Mac B version if you have an M1 Mac or M like Apple Silicon version. And then it, for me, it's an old Intel Mac, so it downloads that one. And yeah, after that, so as you can see, like this is a, a desktop app. You, you have to go through the installer. Um, let me check like where it is. So mm -hmm. so it already created the things, but downloading B. Um, so you don't have to wait for this. Normally, it's like this. Uh, if if this doesn't work out, then I can uh, I can show you the an already downloaded version and installed. The only problem with that is that there is a step like when you download the app. First, it starts in a mode where. Um, like it's a it's a this ultra light mode, so it's it's a limited version. You can only access data, but you cannot upload. And in order to uh, unlock this upload functionality, you have to do the thing what we call the crypto onboarding, and that is basically you have to fund your node. So Swarm, the Swarm mainnet uses the the Gnosis blockchain, and that means that you will need to have some XDAI so that it can make the transactions for you. And also for uploading data to the network, you will need the BZZ token. So I, I will cancel this because like it's not working very well and that's not good, but I will show you the, the network anyhow uh, or the, the version that I, that I had on my machine installed already. So I will just need to put this thing back the library application support and swarm space desktop and if you have that then when you start the app like that no I forgot yeah okay let me that's the demo effect and then the network. Um, yeah, maybe. Uh, so, I'm yeah, so I did some testing and it did not really work well. So this is how I try to do my uh, network connection. And yeah, I managed to overwrite this for some reason. Okay. That's not good, but we will. Oh yeah, that's true. Okay, thanks for like in the in the when you are sharing a screen, it's not necessarily the you see these things. I put it inside. Ah, okay, so that's good. So we will need to do some. Okay, I will just put back the here, remove the application support swarm desktop. So it means someone is listening to the one I'm talking, and that's good news. Um, mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Let me check. Yeah. So now you have all the files downloaded, and it's already set up and for running, we just need to start it. So in this case, it just starts up as this one. 
small icon. And then it opens the UI in the browser. Oh, and um, something is happening, but this is not what I expected. But anyhow, the the point is that like if you have a working internet connection, like <laughs> then this is this is working. So uh, and and you can do this. So yes. I can use your computer. Uh, you have HDMI. Defcon workshop Wi-Fi. All right. Oops, not that, not that one. That one. So wait, um, something is working actually. So uh, we. Sorry, what is the password? Ah, okay. Ah, okay, thanks. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> All right. Let me see if it works better or not. Okay, so it's somewhat working. Like it's, I can show you the, the most functionality of this thing. So, yeah, there is one warning which might just go away once the network is in a condition where it should work. So, yeah, like you can see that uh, I have connected to 114 other nodes. It went. Wait, yeah, okay, it's, it's jumping around. So this is not uh, what usually happens. But yeah, it's like you connect around 100 nodes and 100 peers, and then you can use that to uh, to to upload and download data. You can go here, upload, download. So the only difference is that in the when you install it in the first time, you don't have the wallet set up and you don't have this checkbook, which is also not working at this moment, but the, the point is that at that point you have to do this crypto warning, and for that we actually have a, a way to, like different ways to do, like you can use either a gift code, which we have here, so if you are curious and want to try out and you don't want to buy BZZ, then look for Gasper here, and then he has a bunch of codes already printed, and then like with a good internet connection, so that to, to have a good experience on that. Uh, you can also set up it uh, with XDAI, and we also provided some guides how you can do it with, with a bank card, but like, we are crypto, so don't do that. Uh, <laughs> use the codes. Um, and then, um, so with this app, then you can hear, like, you can upload and download content. I'm a bit, uh, like, now scared to try it because it might give you the, the impression that it's not working, but it is. So like, I will upload my presentation in this format. I need to add the postage stamp. Okay, I have one. So there is this concept of postage stamps. So when you have uh, uh, the money for, for uploading, basically the, this postage stamp is something that you need to attach to your content. And basically it's two things, like you buy a capacity, certain capacity for a certain amount of time. So this is like the post. We call it postage stamp, and then you attach it. I mean, Swarm attaches it to all your uh, data that you upload it, and this is how the the, node, the store nodes know how how long they should be preserved. And then this is also used later for uh, the redistribution of the value of the postage stamp. So the node operators, uh, when they have the data stored uh, in the storage incentives game. Uh, what I will talk a bit about later, uh, they, they participate in that and then they uh, get they can get the value of these postage stamps. So here I chose the postage stamp uh, and then I will upload it and then we will see. All right, so something worked. Uh, 
I mean, I, uh, this is a cheating a bit because I managed to upload the data to the, my locally running Swarm node, so it doesn't mean necessarily that it's already propagated to the network, but um, yeah, it's like it would be good to share with someone and download that, but like this is how it works, like it generates this hash, and then you can just copy this hash and then share it with someone else and they can access the data with this hash from the network. And yeah, it has some functionality where you can manage your wallet and then your balance and your checkbook. So the checkbook is the thing that is used for the, the bandwidth incentives. So if you, if you are running a full node, then this checkbook is, uh, you, do, you don't necessarily have to uh, put money in it, but if you want to download big amount of data, then you can basically make it faster by, by putting money in the checkbook and then how it works is that when your node is requesting data from another node, then they create a, a balance between them. And if your node is only downloading, then your balance will be negative. So then eventually you have to, have to settle that balance and then you can do this with the checkbook. And if you have a full node, you don't necessarily have to do this because the full nodes are participating in, in sharing the data. And, uh, and then basically your, over time, your balance will even out. So. You can also do that if you want to use your full node for uploading data as well, but it's not necessarily to do that. And then we have these postage stamps, and then here you can see the statistics of postage stamp and manage postage stamps. Like this is a, the idea for this is that you can like basically create different kind of content what you want to to share and for how long, and then for those like different kind of categories, you can create different kind of postage stamps and. Uh, upload the data uh, according to this category. And uh, there are also feature called feeds. So this is the, the thing that I talked about, these mutable chunks uh, or mutable data with signed chunks. It enables you to, to create like uh, a version that can be updated over time. And then with that, you can here in this in this UI, you can even use that as a, for example, if you upload your website, then the basic model where you upload it will be like, you, can, you will get like the content hash of the data that you uploaded, but that will change over time as you, as you change your website. So if you want to avoid the paying the cost for like updating your website every time in, in, in ENS and then point it to a different ENS record and pay the transaction cost for that, you can, this, you can use this feeds functionality and then basically update. You can, you can update your feed and then your feed will also have uh, fixed, it's like not changing hash that you can put in ENS and with that you can update your website through the feeds and that for that you don't need to change the, the cost on the blockchain. And we have some settings here. So this is the desktop app, basically just a UI and it looks like it's stabilized a bit. So now we have all everything working seemingly and then we have like a normal number of, of peers. Uh, and yeah, this population is not very correct. So we, we, we have some analytical tools and it shows that there are about 2000 nodes in the network currently. So it's like not 80, uh, not uh, 3800. Um, and most of the nodes are actually like run by organizations that support Swarm. So there are individual nodes as well, and you can also start your node. And I will talk about that in a minute. So. I will just stop this down because like this is the so this is the desktop app and if you want to try out look for that guy um okay so then um, there is another mode which like the full node um so in order to do that uh you need to read a bit about like the the documentation and we just realized that it seems like most people recently doesn't really like reading or like reading documentation or it seems like the the way how to do it better it would be video maybe but so we have documentation about this but we often get questions from people like how to do that but actually the the documentation has this um 
like it, it describes the, the necessary steps and then I'm going to go through this and explain this. Maybe it's, it's complicated how it's written, but this is what you need to do. Basically, you need to create a config file, add six or seven things to it, and then you are good to go. So let's start. I will start from an existing config file because I already created this, and I will go through that line by line so that uh, I can explain like how it works. So this is an existing working full node setup. Maybe I can make it bigger. Oops, I made it smaller. So, um, so yeah, like first of all, like you need to say, tell B that it's you are support. You want to run it in full node, so you have to do this full node through. You have to specify a data there. So like this is where your files live. And then this is, you have to make sure that on that disk where it points to, you have enough space for that. And it's also, you have to make sure that it's an SSD so that it's fast enough. There is a password, don't use one. <laughs> but uh, I mean, that works for demo purposes. Uh, and that protects your your wallet. But like what we do what and what we say here, and maybe what's important to mention is that, uh, so when, when you start B, the first time it creates its own wallet. And uh, the reason for that is that we don't want people to accidentally, you know, import their, their wallet with their funds in it. And then, you know, like, you, it's, it's much better just to start uh, your, your node without, uh, with, a, with an empty wallet and then fund it and then uh, let it run. Uh, because uh, currently there are, there are ways to, to secure your wallet. So Swarm also uses a thing that may be familiar from running get, this clef. So there is, there is a version of clef which works with Swarm, which is called bclef. But we found actually that that was one of the source of the problems of installing your Swarm node. So that made it quite complicated. And uh, because of that, we no longer recommend by default to, to run it with Clef. Also, we recommend people that don't put a lot of money in their full node. So um, we, uh, in, the, in the storage incentives, I will talk about like, if you want to participate in, the, in earning BZZ, you will have to stake some money in it. But the, the, the current stake is like 10 BZZ, which is worth like $5. So it's, I think it's like $5 is not really worth the hassle of setting up a BCLEF. And just you can secure your thing with a reasonably strong password. Then there are two other config options that it's also documented, but um, I will just ask. So the swap endpoint is maybe it's a, it has this historical context. So initially we had this, the swap is called bandwidth incentives internally in Swarm lingo. And for that, you need an RPC endpoint. And I just added one. It's a public endpoint, but obviously you can use like on, a, uh, on the Gnosis chain, it's like you can use GetBlock or, or whatever provider you want to use, or you run your own uh, node, of course. Uh, but so this is an RPC endpoint to access the blockchain. And uh, you also need an initial deposit uh, config variable. So by default, it's not zero because uh, as historically we we recommended people to put some money uh, in their check this is for the checkbook so in order to have some balance but we found out that in order to start you don't really need this and if you don't want to use your full node for uploading or downloading data then you can leave it to the initial deposit to zero in order to do that though, like there is a, a, an initial transaction if you want to run uh, uh, a full node, it, it deploys a, a, a checkbook contract. And for that, you will need some XDAI uh, in order to make the transaction. But that's the only initial cost that you will need. And there is this thing which is documented also that 
you can fine tune your your B node to increase the default number of open files, which is something that um, Unix system have like uh, basically the open files can be open files, but also the, the network connections in Unix are represented as files and then we use quite a few network connections, so it's better to increase the default values. And then one more option is this resolver options, which is only necessary if you want to use ENS. So there is ENS integration of Swarm that if you have an ETH domain registered, then basically you can you can set it uh, in the ENS record. You can set it to your uh, to your Swarm address, and then uh, it it will work with Swarm. But it only works with Swarm if you set up a, a resolver for that. And since this is happening on Ethereum mainnet, this requires a different RPC endpoint than the swap endpoint. So this is a kind of a trade-off and this is also optional and this this one this last option is only needed if you want to enable the debug api so we want to have access from the http api to the internal uh, uh, administrative functionality of your node most likely you want it so i have, for the sake of completeness i added it to the to the default configuration and I will just try to run this. So let's see. Um, I will skip the step of like doing the um, running it one by one. Like uh, so, starting it and following the documentation step by step, and then if that fails, then adding the new one, the new config line. I just, just I will just use the prepared config that I just explained. Okay. Um, why there is no B here. I will just use, I have one, I usually build from source. So, oops, I, okay, address already in use, okay. So there is something running here already. Yeah, it's not the, ah, sorry, no. I'm wrong, wrong tab. It was the the dev mode. So full node B. So this is how you start it. You specify the config file, and then you start it, and then it runs. I will make it a bit smaller so that maybe you can see more at the same time. Smaller. Yeah. So what you can see here is that like you have a node running and then it connects to all these other nodes and then uh, it sometimes locks things like this. Like you, know, you have to be familiar with these things. I can show you how it looks like from the beginning. So you start it, it prints this B and then some things, it prints out some public keys and addresses, version, the chain backend, and overlay address. So there is, it uses a, a, a different address than your, uh, than your Ethereum address that it uses so that basically it's something that is it's a bit harder to just you know run uh, a lot of random nodes and then this overlay address provides some kind of protection against running a lot of nodes and trying to take over some part of the network. So yeah, and then at this point we have a full node running and maybe if the network is working, uh, maybe we can even try to, uh, okay, I closed, no, no, sorry, I hear, I closed it, all right. I don't no longer have the, the, the hash that I uploaded previously. I just wanted to try maybe it downloads. So the, the thing is that now it's, if you start a full node from scratch, it, at the beginning it will start synchronizing data. So the current full node capacity is around 20 gigabytes, but it also has some caching and some other overhead. So it uses more data than that. 
but uh, it tries to like synchronize 20 gigabytes of of data and that is one b nodes capacity this is something that we consider increasing in the future but for now it's like uh, seems a reasonable uh, default and then basically when you start an empty node then it will try to fetch as much as it fills up this internal uh, storage space and so that uh, it can serve other nodes from that so it may happen that if you run a full node then it might not be uh, it might not be able to um, or it may slow down your computer at the beginning or or you know it might not be able to access all the data immediately uh, interestingly if you run a, a light node that is not doing any kind of synchronization it just asks the data from other peers and then it works as long as soon as you you install it so it does not have this synchronization period like if you use ipfs and install that you know that it also have to wait you have to wait a few minutes until it becomes usable this is not the case with the, the swarm light node but this is also the case with the swarm full node and so like this is how you can set it up so um maybe yeah we have like um, 12 minutes left so maybe i can just i will just talk a bit more about like the the storage incentives part uh where it is currently so yeah the there is uh, currently a, a test net and the main net for the swarm network and the test net is uses the the girly blockchain and then in order to participate in testing you will need some girly bzz we can provide that if you need if you want to try out in the discord uh, we have a discord channel so if you join there and if you ask well, want to participate in testing then we can give you girly bzz for trying it out we, these codes are like actually like equivalent to a private key so like if you want to try it on mainnet you can also do and then you can use these codes as a as a wallet uh, private key and then from that you can figure out the rest you can import it to metamask and then transfer the money to that and so what may be interesting is like the current status of the project and where what are the next plans so uh, currently the the storage incentives are on the test net so that means that we are testing out this functionality it's quite interesting actually and i suggest you to read about it that basically there is a uh, a lottery game kind of thing that so the nodes that have like the the shared the same partition of the network they collaborate uh, on the blockchain in a in a game that like they have to uh, commit the a proof of the data that they are storing and they have to create a consensus on that and then based on that they select a winner that takes the the pot but um, over time it's statistically everyone can win and that's how the 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 distribution the redistribution of the funds are solved and uh yeah this happens through smart contracts so we will post um, a lot about this because this is our current focus area that we want to get done and once that's working that will enable of like that will finally enable the, this uh, data economy that I just showed you previously where like people can actually buy capacity on the network and the node operators are compensated for their efforts and so that's one thing that is the current effort that we are doing and after that we we will work on making the like be more uh, stable for like handling bigger data sets and then have enabling it for for uh, use cases which uses like it requires on bigger data sets like for example like video and stuff like that and once that's in place then there that can open the the uh, swarm as a as an application platform for application and then storing data on that and that can generate like the, uh, the the activities on the network and we are also going to upload some 
initial like public good data sets that we talked about like so that to bootstrap the network and make it useful from the get-go but also to compensate early adopters who participate in the in the mainnet and then eventually we expect that like others will follow and uh, therefore like uh, we can bootstrap this data economy and then this can be a self-sustaining uh, system so this is the, the what I wanted to tell, and we have some time left for questions. So, yeah. Uh, you said when the full node runs, it synchronizes existing data. How much storage does it uh, keep from existing data? How much does it keep for new data? So. It, it has a limited capacity, so it's 20 gigabytes currently, what it, it uses, and like it uses existing data in the sense that like it 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 will populate it with data that is already uploaded to the peers so that it will connect their peers which has similar address space and then fetch the data from that so that they basically share uh, the data in a, in a partition of the network and for that the capacity currently is, is 20 gigabytes uh, you can also pin data on, on on your node and that's an extra space that is used but also pinning is a bit different in this context than IPFS so uh, because like if you pin data on your node it doesn't necessarily mean that it's available on the network because your node will be only contacted by other nodes if you are if uh, if the data hash matches your node and then if you upload your data it's not guaranteed so then it only means that you, from your node it will be available. That can be useful for some use case if you want to make a gateway for Web2 kind of like, to, so as a gateway like for, for like compatibility or for applications or websites that does not have like built-in integration with Swarm. So like basically providing uh, a transitioning phase. Uh, but yeah, so that's uh, that's an extra capacity and that's not counted in the in this uh, what we call this called this 20 gigabytes is called the reserve space and this is what you need to prove actually when you participate in the storage incentives that you are storing that data yes uh yeah so there's a lot of other decentralized storage networks yes um i'm trying to figure out what uh, does swarm differentiate itself by its proximity to ethereum if so, what, uh, what sy what's the word? synergies does it have with Ethereum that other networks don't have? And if not, what differentiates it? So, yeah, I, I didn't really want to go into this part because, like, I, this was meant to be a workshop and not necessarily a marketing talk. But, yeah, so I, this is what I wanted to talk a bit about in the beginning. So, yes, yeah, so, for example, like, the, the thing that... For example, the, the built-in incentivization is something that differentiates from, from others. So like with IPFS, there is no incentivization. You can have incentivization with Filecoin, but Filecoin is actually not the same thing as IPFS. So it you requires to run a different daemon and then it's different tooling and the different trade-offs. So what we feel is that like this is an integrated solution that May seems to be easier to set up and may serve some use cases better. And then we can discuss like what are those use cases. Uh, so, I mean, what we feel is that with IPFS you store files and folders and that's useful for many things, but we feel that for example Swarm you can store like data structures that can point to, to things and then application, basically you can create like databases and applications that stored on Swarm and uses Swarm as a backend. So it's like not only not only for storage, but also for like messaging and and as a, as a decentralized cloud, not only just the storage part. Here, uh, sorry. Um, um, two questions quickly. Uh, number one, uh, as I understand, uh, you, have to uh, you have to pay to download and pay to upload, right? Yes. Uh, okay. Second question. Um, you said something about Clef, using Clef in the in Swarm, in Swarm, for example, when you are using multiple Hive clients in, 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 in as a single cluster. 
but uh, the, docu the, the documentation says it recommends it using CLEV. But you right now just said a few minutes ago that it that probably that you're having a little bit of problems with the CLEV uh, so swarm. So how, how, yeah. how does that work? So uh, what I recommend here is that if you want to try out running your own node, start without CLEV. If you have multiple nodes and you want to manage the keys for them and you want to basically have an operation running multiple nodes, then consider running it with CLEV. But by default, I think it's easier to start without CLEV. And what was the first question? Sorry. Uh, yeah, the upload and the, yeah, yeah. Pay, pay to upload, pay to download, yes. Mm, we have three minutes left. Any other questions? Yeah. So it's uh, regarding the download and upload payment. So what, let's say we have this app, YouTube or Netflix running fully on Swarm and there's content that's very viral and everybody's watching it. And of course, you as a provider don't wanna pay for the bandwidth. So in terms of a user experience, that means that every user of this app will have to have a, some sort of a wallet that will have to pay for that content to consume it. So yeah, that's a good question. So what I imagine this is that basically, it, this depends on the application layer and how the application layer manages this. So like in this regard, like Swarm is the, if the, we talk about like it's a decentralized cloud, then it's again like somehow applications can abstract this away. So also on YouTube, you don't pay for like Google Cloud, but like you pay for the YouTube and then how it handles this problem in the background, it's a different story. So we don't have all the answers to that, but like one way to do that is, or one way how we imagine this is that this post system mechanism, currently it's tied to your node, but it's, it doesn't have to be that way. So it can be actually portable. And then basically you can, you can, you can make your application hand out post it stamps and then with that it can enable uploading even in the browser without having to connect to a full node or like having to have capacity for for things so that's we have ideas about that but this is something that still needs to come when applications are built all right and i have a question here uh, you show us that in swarm Take an archive and divide it in small blocks um, while sharing the network. What happens if, for example, for example, my node is corrupted uh, after this project? And what happens if I'm user want to make modifications to the file? So the so all the all the data on Swarm is is stored by this content hash. So basically you can, with that, you can detect if the data has been tampered with or like changed or corrupted. And like all the data has, uh, is, is replicated on the network. So like if only one node is changing the data, then actually it can be caught and actually it will be caught once it's uh, participating in the storage lottery and make a claim for storing data that they have they actually need to make a, uh, they, they have to create a cryptographic proof and when doing that, it can, it, it will reveal that like if they tampered with the data or changed or corrupted, then uh, they cannot really, uh, so at that point they might lose their stake and stuff. So in this regard, like uh, the system has uh, integrity protection built in and, uh, and yeah, so, how to put it like, yeah, so the, the content hashing makes a lot of things very uh, easy in these regards, like the content address hashed. Or, yeah, we also have a grants program. If someone is interested in, in developing apps on Swarm, then we are looking for ideas also and we, <laughs> The thing is that we don't want to build everything, like actually we want to build as little as possible and then uh, create this ecosystem where people participate and create their own stuff and by that contribute to the, to the network and the common goods. You have a question? At the beginning you told us that uh, full node is multi-platform. Do you want 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's written in Go, and Go provides like easy way to compile it to any platforms. Mac, Windows, Linux, you have ARM version, everything. So I, I managed to even run it on my phone, so on Android. So yeah. All right. If there are no more questions, then thank you.